One bag of green tea and one bag of perfect peach tea. I got one guy on Twitter uh, criticizing my choice of tea brands. That I was using a Bigelow brand of tea and some others, but he said, oh, you should get this very patrician tea. So I'll have to go and look up what he said again and, <clears throat> and uh, you know, buy that brand, even though it's more expensive. He says, that's better. I'll try it out, you know. Uh, and tea, uh... I don't know if my voice sounds different right now, but uh, I'm like sick at the moment. But I want that. It's that. It's that certain phase of sickness where you just feel really like relaxed, if you know what I mean. Like it was all tumultuous and 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 kept. It, what what is it? It just felt like a tsunami inside of me yesterday, and then I was super relieved once I finally like got to my bed and just laid down. And this morning. It's like a it's like a kind of sickness phase where it's just everything feels like really relaxed and good in a way. And, and my voice, which was a sore throat yesterday, so it sucked talking. Now it's just like reverberation in my voice. Like I, I can really feel and hear like my sound waves in my own body for some reason, and it's got like this warbliness to it because of all the the mucus and stuff so right now it's actually really fun to talk so i decided to do uh to do this the only downside of recording something is in this current state is is that i'm coughing a lot but i'll have to see if i can edit all those coughs out here we go was there a cough or did i immediately begin the next sentence because if it's the latter then that means i competently edited this but yeah i gotta keep drinking this tea Now, I'm pretty sure that my voice is just going to sound annoying to people, whereas to me it, it sounds fun to talk, but you know, I'm in my own head, literally, so I, it sounds fun from my perspective. It's probably just annoying and nasally, but, you know, hey, at least I'm finally recording another one of these episodes. Uh, when I said I was going to do them every two weeks, it's probably been like a month and a half now. Thing is, though, I actually had recorded an episode of this well on time, like within a week after doing the last one, but I didn't want to release it, and over the course of the next couple of weeks, I I did like two more. A lot of it was like me trying to reiterate what I did in the first one, since I didn't want to release the first one, but I just I ended up recording like three whole episodes, not releasing any of them, because I, I'm, I'm kind of like, you know, like having, like, like, like I'm now at the point of like, being known on the internet to the degree to where like I have fans now and, and viewers now where like anything I say will become part of this narrative that people are constructing in their heads about me and the rest of the PCP because you know when you're a fan of something you like learn all the details and like you construct like a wiki in your own head about it and there is indeed an actual PCP wiki being made at the moment and it's like weird because it's not how you interact with other people. It's like I like you go on Discord, you talk to like the viewers of the PCP and they'll talk to you and talk about you in a way that's very different than how you talk to like a friend. A friend knows things about you, but then like when they explain you to other people or like ask you to elaborate on something you said before, they like how do I say this? It's like they're always interpreting you, if you know what I mean. Like, like, you'll say something to a friend, and they'll get something slightly different out of it than what you said. Like, I don't know, it comes... The point is when it's a, when it's like a viewer of yours who just sees you as like a, a cool, inter, a cool content creator, I feel like they sort of like take what you say word for word in a way. Like, like when you say something about yourself, they take it like it's this sort of like like, fact. Like, it's this sort of, I don't want to use the word objective, it's this, like, um, they take what you're saying like it isn't, like it is, like, this structured thing. Like, there's this physical, like, detail that is, is what it is, and then they just sort of pile that onto the other facts that they know about you, and when they explain you to someone else, they'll, like, explain it sort of, like, word for word, very similarly to how, um, you explained it to them, or how you explained it in a podcast. They explain you the way they would explain a lore in a video game or something. And, you know, 
that's fine. It's just weird at first, because I'm not used to that. And it means that, you know, I, I need to, like, change the way that I explain myself to people, you know? Like, uh, I mean, you know, fuck, these people give me money and also give me uh, viewership and attention, and it means I can post anything I want on Twitter and someone's gonna, like, like it or respond to it. So it's perfectly well worth it. Um, I'm not saying it makes me uncomfortable, I'm just saying it would make me uncomfortable if I shared the wrong information or said it the wrong way, and, and then people sort of understood things weirdly, so, yeah, um, I'm definitely not as just, like, freely open with shit as, like, Digi is, you know, where it's, like, Digi will just, like, mention his mom and his dad, you know, maybe even drop their names sometimes, show their pictures on screen, you know, uh, I don't know. I don't. I'm not as open about things as he is, but that's fine. You know. The the point is that's why I was like hesitant to make an episode of this show for a while because I just didn't think of anything I wanted to talk about that wasn't just a bunch of like deeply personal shiz. But now I just uh, went on like a one week sort of vacation. Yeah, yeah, a vacation. Uh, me going to see my new girlfriend thing. I was calling her my squiggle in the first couple episodes because I didn't want to, like, I don't know. It, it's, again, trying to be, like, secretive with information, but at some point it's like, nah, I don't give a shit, you know. Um, but the point is, I had a lot of, like, things happen or things I thought about because I was in a different environment. So I, you know, was self-reflecting in different ways. So on the plane ride back, I wrote, like, a whole bunch of notes for things I want to talk about on this show. So here we go. Um... So, you know, the first day I was there, we, like, went, because, like, we just had, like, a, a little, like, um, hotel room for us, since, like, she doesn't have any space in her house, so, you know, we just rented out, like, a hotel, and, um, or I guess it's more like a motel. The point is, you know, it was, like, this little cheap, kind of dingy place, and we went to Walmart, and we bought, like, some food, and we bought some, like, paper plates and, and like, plastic, uh, forks, and, uh, I believe we cooked, um, what, what, what was the thing we ate on the first, oh, yeah, we just ate, like, a, um, like a frozen dinner Alfredo Stouffer's type of thing, and we shared that. And it was like, as I was doing all this, I was like, man, this feels really like ghetto, poor, white trash, but I'm like really excited about all of this stuff. And I was telling her, you know, as, I, as we were munching down on the Alfredo, that all of these cheap, shitty amenities really excite me all the time. Uh, even when I think about them, but particularly when I have them. Like, uh, like, like on the plane, when, um, you know, in coach, the flight attendants will come by and be like, Hey, do you want a drink? And I'll say, yeah, I want some Sprite because my stomach's killing me. I want some Sprite. So she's like, okay, she pulls out a little tiny minuscule plastic cup and pulls out a can of Sprite and pours it in there with some ice. And I'm like, I get so excited about how minimalist and cheap it is. Because it's like, not in a saving money sort of way, but in a, it makes me, and what I was telling my girl is that it makes me reflect on, it makes me think about how advanced our society is. That, that with no money at all, with, with so little money, you have things that are this good, you know? Used to be, if you were like quote unquote minimum wage equivalent in say the 1920s, you'd be like whatever you'd be eating would have all sorts of terrible germs and probably some bug wings inside of it, you know, that kind of thing. Like it makes me so excited that we have all this technology that can can make something that's so cheap and yet is so competent and functional, like a Stouffer's meal, you know, like we have all these preservatives that make for more efficient transit and we have, you know, freezing technology, that's like a, a recent invention that allows it to, to stay fresh longer and we have microwave technology, that shit didn't get invented till the 80s by the way, I didn't know that, but like Digi was like, hey, did you know that my, do you know that like a uh, microwaves didn't exist till the early 80s and I was like wait what and he was like yeah I asked my parents and I was like well I'll ask my parents and they said yeah and I was like wow the 80s so me and her wouldn't have been able to have this meal uh even 30 years ago right and like plastic forks and, and plastic plates it's like they're so cheap and yet so effective and when I think about the rest of um time the rest of human civilization throughout history and most other places in the world even today, the fact that we have so much stuff for so little money makes me so hyped about, like, our economy and our civilization. And I was just like, it makes me so excited. It just makes me go like, yeah. And, and she was like, 
how are you not an optimist when you think like that? Because like, cause she, like, she says, like, I'm an optimist and stuff. And you're all like, you and your friends, you and your PCP friends are all like cynics. You're all like cynical and pessimistic. And I'm like, and, and that was a good question. Like, I don't identify as an optimist, really. I was thinking about it. And the conclusion I came to is that I don't need optimism to be in a good mood. Like, the thing is, is that I'm pessimistic and, and cynical about, like, people in general. Like, like, any person, if I don't know you as a person, then I'm just gonna assume you're, like, terrible at things, and you're gonna fail, and that you aren't gonna be smart, you know? And, you know, I know plenty of people personally who I just don't, like, think are, like, that good at anything, and therefore you're like, yeah, you're kinda not, you're not, you're not useful, you know? Um, but then, like, me, myself, I value myself immensely, like, I think of myself as really competent, and I think that I, myself, can survive and be good, and then I know all these people around me who I surround myself with, who I also think are really good. So I think of, like, really good people as, like, a minority, but that I, that I can work with that. Like, the amount of good people that there are, I can associate myself with them, and then things can be good, you know? I, I guess, I guess that's what I think. I don't surround myself with people who I think are shitty, you know? I, when, when some group or some entity or some association starts to piss me off, I disassociate myself with it. I don't want to deal with that. I only surround myself with people that are good. People that aren't annoying. So many times on the internet, I'll have, like, uh, like on Twitter, you know, there'll be people like Jesse, especially, who will complain about what shitty, annoying people are saying on Twitter. And I'm like, I don't follow shitty, annoying people on Twitter. I unfollow them if they get annoying or shitty. But Jesse, like, you know, I guess he's just sort of like a born uh, cleanup crew for human civilization. He can't help but surround himself with all this filth, this human trash. And he just has to rage against it constantly. Like, he's definitely that kind of person. Um, I don't want to deal with that. I don't want to try and fix the world, try to fix stupid people. So I'm just over here only being with good people. Oh, man, okay. I'm realizing my head is pretty stuffy right now. I am, like, talking very circularly, saying um a lot, repeating my words a lot to try and finish my sentences. I'm definitely not very coherent, especially after, like, a week. You know, my, my head is just kind of out of it. But, you know, oh well, at least it's content. Feeling like doing some content. Okay, um... Oh yeah, you know, like, I guess part of why I'm, why I think so positively about cheap amenities is that, like, like, when I got interested in economics a couple of years ago, um, like, when I re when I listened to the audiobook of Basic Economics by Thomas Sowell, and I was all like, dude, this book is super cool, and it talks about, like, you know, just how, just how fragile and special our current modern economy is like it really goes against the tide of what human civilization is by default um and yet at the same time if you just have the right kind of society that values you know personal freedom and like personal property and respect towards one another and trust in one another then wealth sort of just happens you know like if you have a society that's that's safe and trusting and free um, and individuals can keep what they have and earn what they and earn what they have um, people just sort of become great like society can become great if you're if you're a morally good society whatever morally good means this week um, and yet it's just not normal like that, that takes a lot of effort to happen but when it happens it happens really fucking well and like uh, I believe basic economics goes into like one little historical thingy that happened in the late 80s I believe Maybe the early 80s, and I've heard a number of, like, people talk about it on YouTube and stuff, that, um... There were some USSR officials who, uh, took their first visit to America, and... The moment that, like, really, like, blew them away... Was when they went into a grocery store in Texas. You know, they'd seen all the statues and shiz, they'd seen all, like, the crazy buildings that we've built, and I'm sure they have crazy buildings too, so they were like, yeah, whatever, you know. But when they saw... A grocery store, uh, just a normal ass grocery store, they were blown away. And like one of them said that like that was the moment where like my my last vestige of of faith in communism went away, or at least our country specifically. 
because they were like, dude, like in our country, people like have to line up for hours just to get some shitty bread. You know, like like the, the amount of stuff in this store beats what our highest ranking officials and our highest elites have access to. And it's so cheap, and it's so neatly arranged, it's so well lit, it's so colorful, there's so much of it, every shelf is filled with the stuff, and it's so much variety, and it's so normal. All these people are just walking in, not feeling special at all. This is, this is accessible to normal friggin' people in this country. Anyone can walk in, and pretty much anyone could afford a meal from this, and they could get a meal of pretty much anything they want. You know, I guess I'm just always thinking about the other dimensions beyond me, you know? I, I try to, like, to think about things from other people's perspectives. So when I see a thing that, it like, costs a little bit of money, I think about how much value it would be to have to be to someone to, like, Who's from Africa and shiz, you know, shiz. I keep saying shiz today. Uh, and I also, whenever I see something with technology, I think, I specifically think George Washington being with me and me showing it off to him, being like, dude, George Washington, this whole, this whole, like, freedom, uh, constitution, uh, thing you, you, you helped create, you know, this country of America, United States of America, uh, we did all this, we made... You know, with with the help of some other countries here and there, we made all this like cool stuff, and we have all this technology, and and you know, be like, I want to know what your reaction would be. You know, like I'd love to see the re. I always think about the reaction that someone from a hundred years ago would think if they saw it, and then two hundred and fifty years ago would think if they saw it. But most likely, George Washington. That's the main one who I'd want to show stuff. You know, imagine just like you have George Washington. You know, it, it, it it's a it's a comedy. Uh, family friendly movie where he gets sucked into the future into 2017 and you know you have to like you gotta go to like a Coles and be like have a, a montage of like getting him out of all those robes and putting him in like a you know like a t-shirt with a jacket gotta like you know just take off the dang wig just gonna go bald today man you know um, go to the dentist get some like actual teeth get some dentures and shiz you know and be like yeah now try to talk with like modern dialect and blah 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 you know uh I feel like there's just, when you're sick, there's, like, mucus in your brain, too. So, like, your, like, thoughts have to kind of blow in order to open up the passageway to get to the other parts of your brain that control what you're saying. I don't know if you can tell, but I am, uh, deliberately slurping more slurperly so that you can, like, tell that I'm slurping. I know that, like, radio people will do that with, like, say, like, holding a piece of paper. Like, like, Rush Limbaugh does that, where he's like, okay, so, you know, there's some certain things that were in the news today, and I printed them out, and he'll do this. He'll be like, when he, op when he like, reads the papers so that you know he's reading a paper. Like, like, if you pick up a piece of paper, it's just gonna sound like this, right? But he makes it go like this, right? But then eventually, like, people were calling in being like, Rush, that's so annoying. Why are you doing that? That's so unnecessary. And he's like, well, fine. So eventually, it got to the point where he's like, so there was something in the news today. I printed it out. It says blah, 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 blah. <coughs> Man, I'm so glad my sore throat's gone. Like, there's no way I can't be in a good mood when my sore throat is over. There's nothing more annoying than a sore throat. Well, okay, headaches are worse. I, you know, I just, I generally have good health, so I don't have to worry about things being painful on my, on my body, and so therefore, the things that do occasionally go wrong, like a sore throat, makes me really sad. It's, I really hate not being able to talk. Yeah, so, you know, like, I'm sure most of you know that, like, Digi has talked about, like, there was this period where him and his family were poor. I think there was, like, a couple of periods where that was happening. I'm not really sure. And, like, I was always assuming, like, that they were, like, Poor, poor, like, you know, like, like, shitty house, life, p terrible, poor, and, and stuff, um, and I was like, yeah, you know, I've never, like, been poor like that, you know, like, I was, always, I've always been like, yeah, you know, like, our family's just always, like, had our, you know, her finances together for the most part, um, but then, like, I was in the car with him one point, like, a, like, a, like a month or two ago, and, like, he was mentioning, like, oh, yeah, yeah, we were so poor, we were on food stamps for, like, four months, and I was like, wait, <laughs> and I was like, wait a second, like, there were times where my family was on food stamps for, like, two years, and we're not that, and, and most of the time before and after that, we were only slightly better off than we were during that period, and, like, even now, my dad's business is successful and all, but we have to pay so much taxes, and we're, like, 
three years behind on paying taxes, my family is. So it's almost like we don't have all that money for the most part, you know? Like, uh, amenities and spending and splurging are still very, very thinly spread, even today. Um, I was like, wait, have I always been poor? I was like, but I guess by other people's standards, I guess so. And Digi was like, yeah, if, you're, if you were on food stamps and you were poor. And I was like, oh. And Digi was like, you know, I mean, I guess part of it is that when we were on food stamps, we were also living with, like, annoying relatives, and so that was what made it miserable. Like, it just wasn't a good life situation. And I was like, okay, that really explains it then, because it's like, no matter what's ever gone on with my family and our finances, they, my parents have just always acted really calm. Like, they're always on top of things. They never freak out. They're never, they're never like, getting overwhelmed with stress. You know, there's only been, like, a couple of times where my dad got a little bit mad at me from, like, stress. He was like, okay, let's go. Like, that kind of, that kind of burst out, outburst. Like, ugh, that kind. That, that's, that's, like, the most mad my dad gets yeah, at, at things, you know. My mom only ever gets mad at me when I uh, waste something. Like, sometimes I'll throw out some boiling water, and she'll be like, why'd you throw out that boiling water? We could have done something with it. And I'm like, I'm sorry, Mom, I changed my mind about what I wanted to eat. And she'll be like, ugh. Like, my my parents, they got, like, married when they were, like, 33, and they had me, their first child, when they were 34. So, like, they were completely competent adults before they had children. So, you know, they'd had marriages before, um, but they didn't have any kids. So, like, I was their first child. So, like, that's the benefit of, of having kids when you're old is that you're really mature. So I never felt like we were poor. Like, we always had our shit together. That's the thing, you know? I never felt poor. I just felt like I couldn't have nice things. <laughs> you know, like... And, um, recently, I've kind of sort of gotten into Stefan Molyneux, who's like this, uh, libertarian YouTube political guy. A lot of his modern videos are him going like, uh, oh, you know, Trump may be flawed, but the left is saying this about Trump, and it's completely inaccurate, and you're just all so completely daft. I can't believe you'd be like that. And then, as I continue to reiterate the point over and over again, I start acting really raspy. I start doing this really raspy voice where I stick my teeth out, and I just keep saying the same thing over and over again, getting raspier and raspier, getting even raspier. The left is so retarded. You're all a bunch of altars. <laughs> and then I get back to the topic, and I have this very concerned look on my face, and uh, continue with the subject. And I never edit my videos. I it's just one long take of me being in front of my microphone and bobbing back and forth in front of my blue background and never editing out anything I ever say. And brilliantly, I never say um for the most part, and I never stutter or have long gaps. I just keep talking, which is po probably exactly why I reiterate my points over and over again and have to go into that raspy voice in order to, you know, fill in all the space. I don't know why I don't just fucking edit my videos. But he's been doing them for a fucking long time. I, I, I introduced him to Digi saying, hey, this is what I expect your body of work to be like in 10 years from now. Because Stefan Molyneux has done these like podcast video things since 2005. Like he was on YouTube at the very beginning of YouTube, right? He, I think he started his podcast before YouTube was around. He has 3,500 podcasts. Like he does like multiple every week. And they're usually, like, long. They range from 30 minutes to 2 hours every time. Unbelievably prolific guy. Um, okay, I, I really wanted to talk about Stefan Molyneux because I find him fascinating. And, like, his early content is, is not really about current issues, or at least not the ones I listen to. A lot of his stuff is, his early stuff especially, is just, like, theoretical philosophy about, you know, like, libertarian ideals of, like, hey, what if the state didn't exist, or what if the state was, like, this instead of this, you know? And it's pretty good stuff. A lot of it is definitely things I haven't heard before. Um, it's, it's really terrible audio quality in the beginning, but, uh, it's interesting stuff. And, uh, there's one video of his, it's one of his first YouTube videos, but it was like his 250th podcast or so. But anyway, it's one of his first videos, and he's just in his car talking about stuff, talking about, like, Nazis, and like, you know, can you re- Like, okay, you can't blame a soldier that was said, shoot them or I'm gonna shoot you. And you can't blame the generals, because the general was told, hey, tell that guy to shoot him or I'm gonna tell someone to shoot you. And you can't blame the marshals, because the marshal was told to do this and that. Now, there were plenty of Nazis who- decided to rise up the ranks in Nazism and, 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 and 
who like did more than they had to so you can blame them but they didn't necessarily know that their government was that evil not at the beginning you know and and even other people like like can you how many people can you really blame and what Stefan Molyneux said was that the only in my opinion the only people who are perfectly guilty are the intellectuals were the philosophers, the people who sat in their colleges and their campuses and in their homes and, and just wrote ideas, and their ideas were evil. That kind of thing. He's, and anyway, I, I swear I'm going to bring this back to the whole me being not with money in my family thing. Um, he's like, you know, so many of these philosophers back in the day who, who, who spurred on Nazism were... Uh, we're trying to, we're falling into a sin that many philosophers do, a, a, a mistake that many philosophers make, is that they were trying to normalize the way that they were raised into an ideology that the world could live by. All of these philosophers, many of them, were raised by Lutheran families, Lutheran fathers who had a very strict, harsh, you know, un cunning, unforgiving uh, style of parenting that was very strict, very harsh, very punishing. And so when they took to their books and they took to their writing, they tried to like come up with a world philosophy, a set of rules by which society could operate that reflected the way that they were raised. They were trying to normalize the way that they were raised, trying to rationalize the mistakes and crimes and sins of their parents as something that is a moral good or a moral necessity. And he's like, many philosophers fall into this trap. Ayn Rand herself couldn't avoid falling into this mistake. So I, you know, listened to that, and it made me reflect on myself, and like, okay, well, how was my view of the world influenced by the way I was raised? And like, you know, because we never had money, really, we never had, like, we always had enough money to, to be just fine and be comfortable, but never enough money to, like, buy nice things. And, like, I was really brought up in this like mentality that if you want something nice you have to work to make it happen like if you want something cool you have to put in extra effort to to, to earn the money to make it if you want something to happen you just gotta make it happen yourself that no one's gonna come in and just give it to you you know and like as i've you know grown up and and had different life experiences i've been adjacent to like people who it's like uh their parents just give them a friggin like beach house or something or a little apartment condo next to a lake with a boat like here you guys can have that you just got married have it and it's like wow you know i don't have any we don't have any like rich people in our family and like you know my family isn't poor enough to get like that many government amenities, and whenever we do, my dad's goal is to make enough money to where we don't have to have that. You know, when we were on food stamps, my dad's, one of his biggest priorities was make enough money so we can buy all our own food uh, with our own money. I mean, we'll take advantage of handouts if we're given, if we're given them, right? But, you know, the idea is, you know, try to not be dependent on that. And so, I really think that that's kind of like where my mentality comes from, of like, like, you shouldn't expect to be given stuff, you know? Like, you just have to make it happen on your own. And, like, you know, as an adult, I can reflect on that, like, mentality and be like, yeah, but, like, most people don't think exactly like that. Like, a lot of people are like, you know, hey, if you're given something, you'll do something nice with it, you know? If you're just given something for free, you're not just gonna be lazy. You're gonna, like, put effort into, like, making that gift worth something. And those people are right. You know, most people, if given a handout, are gonna be responsible with it. But, like, my default mentality of things is you can't expect to be given anything. Like, not that it's wrong to be given something, but, like, you shouldn't expect it. Like, 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 as a teenager learning about how, like, jobs work and how, like, benefits and, like, pensions work, I was like, why would you be given money after you stopped working? Like, why, why would you still be getting paid after you stopped doing the job that you're getting paid for? You know, like, what's, what's the point of that? Like, why, why is that normal, right? And I, when I first heard of benefits as a thing, like as a kid, like, oh man, a great dental plan, a great health plan, a, you know, they give you a car. I'm just like, why not just give you more money? Like, why do they have to buy these things for you? Why don't, if they have this extra cash to spend on you, just give you the cash, you know, just give you the money and let you decide what to do with it. And like, I'm always thinking, oh man, if you get this, then what's it being taken out of? You know, like, if you're given a car with your job, that just means you're gonna get paid less in your actual wages 
probably equivalent to exactly the price of that car. But, like, I talk to my friends and stuff, not my PCP friends, they're all smart, but, like, normie friends, like, people who I've encountered in my life, and they don't, it doesn't seem like that crosses their minds, you know, like, they're like, oh man, this business doesn't give us a dental plan, they can't afford it or whatever, and it's like, yeah, and, like, if they gave you a dental plan, they just pay you less money, you know, like, because, like, anything they give you is money they're not giving you. Why don't they just give you the money and then you can decide to go to the dentist yourself, right? And I know it's because, like, with insurance specifically, it's like, if more people get insured by the same place all at once, it's more efficient, you know? Obviously, there's lots of detailed economic ramifications that make way more sense, but just my- I'm just talking about my, like, you know, worldview, the way it was set as a, at a young age, was like, you know, if I'm given something by my parents, it's gonna come out of somewhere. I was made very acutely aware of that, you know? So whenever I think about, whenever I like, you know, I'm in a, stuck in an airport all night and CNN is in every single room and they're debating the value and merits of like this government program that gives people healthcare versus this government program that gives people healthcare versus this government program that gives people this and that and gives people this and that, I'm immediately thinking, well, at the cost of what? What are we not getting as a result of paying for that? You're not just getting the money out of nowhere. It's basically just coming out of taxes, right? And yeah, the people who, like, are the richest are the ones who are going to get taxed the most, but that just means they're going to be spending less money on stuff, and spending money stimulates the economy, which helps everyone. So it's like, you know, like, like I just sort of naturally assume that things are going to come from somewhere, and that's why when I listened to Basic Economics by Thomas Sowell, and it said exactly the way that my worldview was, I was, that I got so excited about that. That's why I love that book so much. It just, it just, it just, it just, uh sort of gives, like, this structure and, like, this, like, actual factualism to, like, the way that I see the world already, you know, and I don't know how flawed that book is, I don't know how many people have poked holes in its logic, but it seems, it just makes so much sense to me that that's why it's my favorite book. Well, certainly my favorite non-fiction book. But yeah, again, you know, I try to be, like, open-minded about things, and I've sort of, you know, like, again, as I said, when you give people stuff, two out of three times they're gonna do something good with it, you know? Like, think about the, uh, the, the parable from the Bible, right? Where, uh, the parable that Jesus tells his followers is, uh, okay, there's this dude who owns, like, uh, this, like, this, this, this is, like, a real estate guy, he has a big house, has a lot of money, has, like, some farmland, and he's gonna go out on a trip, and he's got three servants, and he's like, okay, servants, I'm gonna go out on this trip, but I want you to do stuff with my money, so, uh, do stuff with my resources, right? So, one servant, he gives 10 shillings to. Like, okay, do stuff with these 10 shillings, you know, benefit my, uh, my estate. And you over there, the second guy, I'm giving you 5 shillings. Okay, now you over there, the third guy, I'm gonna give you 1 shilling. All three of y'all, do stuff with that money, make it, make it productive, um, do good stuff with it, and, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll be back. So when the dude left and came back, he was like, alright guys, the three of you, show me what you did. And the first guy's like, dude, I, I, I invested the 10 shillings, and now it's 20. The second guy's, dude, I, I invested the 5 shillings, and now it's 10. And he's like, you two are awesome, go to heaven, basically is what he says. He's like, you get to have lots of reward. But then the 1 shilling guy, he was like, Oh, sir, you know, I know that you're all harsh and shit, and you're all, like, judgmental and unforgiving, so I didn't want to risk losing it, so I just buried it, you know? And so here it is, I dug it out, you know, it's got some dirt on it, but I hope you still like it. And, and, and the dude is like, ugh, you're such a fuckboy. First of all, don't talk to me like that. Like, what do you mean I'm judgmental? Oh, shit, I mean, don't complain. God damn, Jesus Christ. <clears throat> but also, you're a big lazy butthole just sitting on all that money. You should take a risk, you should try and be responsible with it. Don't laze out, uh, I'm sending you to hell, or the, what he says in the metaphor is, uh, you're gonna get punished for that, go into the fucking dungeon or whatever. Um, so, like, you know, it, it's Jesus telling the world that, like, you know, if you're given something, do something with it, take a chance, you know? Uh, any gift you have, be it a talent or money. But the thing is, and I just realized this five minutes ago, which is why I told this parable to you guys, is that this kind of shows that, yeah, two out of three people are gonna be good. Like, overall, that dude's estate profited immensely from that, from those handouts. Like, even if he'd given all three of them the same amount of shillings, like if he'd given them ten to each of them, he would've, he would've, um, broke even on those last ten, but he would've made twenty shillings in profit on those first two guys who actually are good. So, 
You know, like when you think about that, it, it have a harder time just thinking of government handouts as these things that just promote poverty and shit. Really, the reason why government handouts do that is because they're designed to do that on top of just being handouts. I don't know if you guys know what, like, conservatives, but especially libertarians say all the time, is that, like, you know, if you're given stuff, then you're going to be dependent on being given stuff, and, and therefore it's going to be harder to, like, make stuff for yourself. And also those, those uh, handouts incentivize you to not do work, so therefore you're going to become less productive and you'll be even more dependent on it. And, and, and so people are like, yeah, we need to stop handouts. But I'm like, why not just do handouts that don't encourage not working, right? Like, disability and sh like disability benefits. It, like, I have an uncle, Uncle Bill, because everyone has an Uncle Bill. My Uncle Bill, like, my Uncle Bill was a construction foreman and stuff, or something like that. He's a construction dude, laying down concrete, and he, like, destroyed his back doing that. He had to get surgery, and his back is all sensitive and, like, easy to make him miserable at all times. So he got a disability for that. And it's like, you know, like, I guess what I've been told by, like, other members of my family is that, dude, like, he could just be a foreman. Like, he could just tell people what to do and, like, not lift a finger. He is so skilled, he knows his shit so well, that he could easily make bank just showing up at a construction site and pointing at what to do and he wouldn't have to lift a finger. He could be doing, like, like, like physically, it wouldn't be that much worse than just sitting in his apartment, which is what he does, right? Um, it's not like he does nothing. He is, like, a hobbyist dude. He does do some work for people. He does, like, mixing music and painting stuff. But, you know, none of it is, like, making him money. Um, he just lives off the disability for, like, the last, I don't know, 15 years or so. Um, and, and he said that, like, well, if I was a foreman, people would be screwing things up, and I wouldn't be able to resist going up and grabbing something myself and then destroying my back. <sighs> Whatever. But, like, the point is, like, he's, I think he's, like, outright said, you know, if I was better, if I did work, then I wouldn't get the disability, and therefore, you know, my, my income would be less secure. And it's like, yes, there you go, you know. It really encourages you to be like that. Um, that's, that's how the disability works. It's like, if you're, basically government handouts, at least in America, are like, if you're useless, then you get free stuff, you know? So it, in, it incentivizes uselessness. So the, the thing is, okay, that's an obvious problem with handouts, right? And like, you know, people talk about how like in the inner cities, in American cities, that's where like handouts are the most pervasive and that's where people are the most poor and then there's crime and stuff. And so it's like, you know, like, oh man, all these handouts have, like, ruined cities and stuff, and it brings down the overall, um, quality of life in America, on average, and it's like, okay, but, like, are those handouts disastrous just because they're handouts, or are they disastrous because they're disastrous handouts with bad ideas stacked on top of the idea of just being free shit, right? So, the, the, what I'm getting at is that people have been talking about the idea of universal basic income, which is something I've talked about on my Devu Goes to Saturn channel recently, which is everyone gets a thousand bucks in their bank account at the end of the month. Every month. Everyone gets it. Like, each social security number gets a thousand dollars in your bank account every month, no matter who you are or what you do. Like, even if you're a felon, even if you're a billionaire, right? It's, it doesn't just go to poor people. So if you're poor, you don't have to worry about making money and then losing the thousand dollars, right? You're gonna get it no matter what. So, like, it's gonna be useless to all those billionaires, right? Like, it's, it's gonna be wasting the money on the billionaires because they don't need the money, right? But the point is, the reason to give it to everyone is so that you don't have the bureaucratic overhead of making sure you're not too rich, right? And you don't have to make people afraid to become independent. If you give someone something no matter what, then they won't be afraid to continue being useless. And of course, when you hear something like that, you're like, okay, plenty of people will just never work ever. I'm pretty sure Ben has told me, like, yeah, if I was given $1,000 every month, I just wouldn't do anything. And I guess that's fair enough, but I would do stuff with that money. I would still work, and I know Digi would still work, I think. So that there we go. Once again, two out of three, right? Now, can the economy survive if two out of three people are productive? I don't know, but I'm just saying, like, I find that to be an idea worth trying out or something. Try it, you know? Like, just... Just do it, come on. Like, all we gotta do is just upend our entire economy and legal system for just a couple of years. Just try it out, guys. Jeez. God, I'm so annoying in this one. I'm doing all these stupid voices. I'm the I'm the new Stefan Molyneux, man. And people have talked about how, like, um, 
let's say you are a loser who like you know blows your money on alcohol or weed every month um and like you can't get a job because you're completely incompetent and in our current society, those people will probably either end up on the streets or more likely just end up crashing in their family or friends' couches forever and ruin everyone's lives, their, their own and the people around them. They'll make everyone miserable and they'll be shitty people. And what I've heard people say when defending universal basic income is that it will take away those people's excuses to not do anything. Because, like, here, here's the thing. You know, in, in our current reality, without universal basic income, if, like, the dude's sister who he's sleeping with is, like, sleeping, you know, on her couch and stuff, he's like, oh, I can't do anything, and she's like, dude, just go get a job, like, clean up, go try out for jobs and stuff, and he's like, no, I can't do it, I have no money, I can't do anything, I, I can't afford new clothes, I can't afford to, like, shave every day, I can't afford to, like, get a haircut, and, you know, I can't afford shampoo, so, like, how am I supposed to get a job anyway, you know? I can't afford a car, I can't afford this, I, I'm completely out of, I'm completely out of resources, man, I, I can't do anything, man. You know, that, that's, the, that's the kind of excuse that some people will give. But, in the reality with universal basic income, she can be all like, dude, you're gonna get a thousand dollars on the first, alright? So use that money to clean up, okay? And if you don't do it, I'm kicking you out. So it sort of like, takes, yeah, sure, a thousand dollars can be people's excuse to not work but it can take away your excuse that you're completely helpless, right? It takes away your excuse that you have no power, that you have no resources, that you have no choices. And I'm like, yeah, that, make, that makes perfect sense. Again, so many of government handouts are bad because they like give you something very specific and the government themselves decides what to give you and when and how and then they give you all these rules that you have to follow in order to do it, you know? They, so it's like the government trying to control you, which is obviously what the government wants to do. The reason why government handouts are so popular with every government is not because they want to be generous to people, um, they do it because it's an amazingly convenient way to control people's lives and to, and to corral people into living the lifestyle that the, that the bureaucrats want us to live. The fact that it's so politically popular is what makes it so pervasive. I mean, obviously the government would just tell us what to do, you know, in a completely totalitarian way if they could, but that's politically unpopular, you won't win elections like that. But handouts with a bunch of rules and shit is a way to tell people what to do and tell people how to live that is politically popular, you know? Every politician can come up and be like, y'all, we're gonna give you this free thing. And the guy who is running against me who doesn't wanna give you this free thing, uh, he wants you to die. So, um, d d don't vote for me instead. And those people are able to win elections, you know? I mean, you may think that in America a couple months ago, those people did not win, but even the Republicans who won this time are, aren't saying we're not gonna give you stuff. They're just saying, we're going to give you something slightly different than what you're getting right now, you know? So, you know, there you go. It's, it's still basically the same thing. There's no one winning elections, even in America, uh, who is outright saying, we're going to give you less stuff. Even, like, hardcore conservative people, like Ted Cruz, I don't think ever says, let's give people less stuff. He's just saying, let's uh, clean up the bureaucracy in the stuff-giving committee. And obviously, I'm not saying we should stop giving people stuff at all either, because people are dependent on it. You know, it may be a fucked situation that our government is in, that our uh, society is in, but you can't just stop doing it because people need it. It's like government bullshit, societal bullshit is like a game of Jenga, where you have all these blocks of bullshit that have stacked up, but if you, you can't just dismantle it, you know, haphazardly. If you just take out the bottom, if you just start taking it apart, it's gonna collapse and, and cause a 9-11 all over everyone's face. So, you know, if you want to dismantle it, you have to do it slowly and know exactly how to do it so that not too many people die. I'm calling it, I, I'm, I'm saying die that way because there was someone on CNN who was like, you know, if, if we were, if we were peel and replace Obamacare the way that Trump is saying, uh, people are gonna die. People are gonna die, okay? There were some doctors who said that, like, if, if we take away Obamacare, some people are gonna die. They're gonna die! They're gonna die, da, 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 da. They're gonna die! They're gonna die! Die, die, die! They're gonna die! They're gonna die! They're gonna die! They're gonna die! Mmm. I'm gonna be so impressed if people can get through this without, like, their eyes watering from annoyance of my voice. You know, when I was in the airport, being all sick and stuff, and sneezing sometimes, my sneeze 
are so loud that there's always like at least someone who will say bless you. Like it's so loud that like there's always gonna be like, it's like like it's gonna turn like five people's heads and, and whoever says bless you first is gonna say it and I'm gonna be like thank you, cause I sneeze so loud whether or not I'm sick. What the hell was I talking about? Oh yeah yeah the money with the, you know there's one last thing I want to say about it. Like I think one of the moments that really started to shift my perspective about the idea of giving people free stuff was when I watched Scarface all by myself uh, on VHS in my room, because that's something I, I do, you know. Uh, my whole Why Don't I Like Movies series, which is on my main channel, is a reflection of something that I used to do a lot, which is just look at my collection of VHS tapes and then sometimes randomly watch one. So I, that's how I saw Scarface. And my favorite scene from the movie, my favorite moment, my favorite line, is toward the end when Scarface is in his giant, you know, gold-studded uh, jacuzzi, just hanging out, being topless, being naked probably underneath the bubbles. And, like, his girlfriend or whoever, it's been a while, I only watched it once, but, like, you know, th the lady person is all, like, you know, trying to, like, talk to him or do a thing. And Scarface is just Charles Foster caning it up to, like, no tomorrow. He's just being all, like, yo, man, like, don't... Don't give me this shit, bitch. Don't talk to me like that. I'm I'm the best. I'm the goddamn Goda. Uh, I'm fucking... Don't... I'm the best. Fucking fuck you, you know? He's being a total asshole to her. And she's like, why are you being such an asshole? And he's like, look at me. See all this? I'm the... Look at me. I'm obviously the best. I made all this happen. I sold coke and shot dudes in the balls better than anybody. So I, I earned my place on the throne. And she just says, I wish you had been given your money. I wish you'd been given your wealth instead of earning it. Because if you'd been given it, you'd feel guilty and you'd feel an obligation to be nice with it. You'd feel an obligation to do good with it. And then she like, you know, stormed off being all mad and stuff or something like that. And he's all just like, mm -hmm, you know, um, and that's what happened. And I was like, and I, and I watched that scene and I was all like, man, yeah, that's actually a good point. When... Like, sure, on one hand, you can say that if someone earns something, they're going to be more responsible for it, and uh, and if someone is given something, they're going to be irresponsible with it. But sometimes it can also work the exact opposite way, where if you earn something, you feel like, oh, well, since I earned it, then I can do whatever I want. Nah, nah, nah. But if you were given it, you're like, oh, shit, I don't really deserve this. I need to, like, do good with it. And I'm like, yeah, that's a good point. Okay, that's enough of that topic. You're listening to Free Vu Radio, and now let's move on to the next subject that I wrote on my uh, my notes here. So, um, you know, my girl's been like, I don't know what to call her. Fuck it. Okay, her name is Nikki. Okay, Nikki was telling me, you know, hey, I want to meet your friends. Like, turn on, you know, the Facebook Messenger, fa face cam chat app, or or the turn on audio call and then shove the phone in front of your friends. I want to talk to them. I want to in introduce me to them. Nah. and I'm like. No, I'm, I'm, I don't know. That'd be weird. And she's like, why? Do you, why don't you want to show me off? Me, me, me. And I'm all like, cuz. They'd be weirded out by that. And she's like, why? And I'm like, I don't know. It's just how guys are. Jeez. You know, it's like, Digi specifically has even mentioned, like, yeah, you know, I don't, I don't like it when guys show off their girlfriends to me. You know, like, if you show that to a bunch of dudes, they're just gonna be like, oh, fuck you. All happy in a relationship. Go die on the Washington Memorial by landing on it from an airplane ass first. You know, that kind of thing. And, but, you know, meanwhile, if a girl shows off her boyfriend to her friends, it's like, they're all like, oh, hey, I'm so happy for you. And I'm like, okay, I guess that makes sense, you know. And so that's why, I mean, like, like, I only know, you know, like, specifically because Digi specifically says, I don't like it when guys show off their girlfriends to me, like, I'm not gonna do it to him. I'm only, like, like, look, Nikki, you'll meet them at some point, you know? It'll just happen naturally. She's like, why doesn't it happen now? Why doesn't it happen now? And I'm like, oh, bleh. <clears throat> so, meanwhile, when I was visiting her for a week just now, uh, there was a day where, she, like, we went and met a bunch of her friends and her family and stuff. And, uh, I thought it was a fun time, you know, we didn't talk much, but, you know, they were all hanging out with each other, and I was just sort of there, hugging the shit out of her, and, you know, I was like, okay, cool, you know, and, and so we met them, and, and, and that was that. But then the next day, it turns out that, like, most of her friends hated me. Like, they were, like, they were mad at her for how I was, quote-unquote, acting terribly or something, like, 
I was specifically like not talking for the most part. I was just trying to be quiet, you know, so I didn't, so that I wouldn't be annoying, you know. Like I, I don't know what these friends of Nikki's are like. I don't know like what kind of topics they'd be interested in. I'll just like sit here and wait for them to like bring up a topic, and then I'll, I'll say things, and and you know, if they ask me questions, I'll answer, and I'll be like, okay, now I'm asking the question of you in return, you know. I didn't want to, you know, yeah, I was just trying to be quiet, you know. I, I said things, you know, I was like, I told jokes here and there. But for the most part, I was quiet. But turns out some of her friends hated that. They were like, why wasn't he opening up? Why was he being so reclusive? But what really um, took me aback was that, uh, like, a couple of them were saying that I was like, we're telling her, we're complaining to her that I'm, like, so egotistical and arrogant. And I'm like, well, that's true. But it really took me aback that, like, it shows so easily. Like, I can just sit there and not say a damn thing, yet it still comes through so strongly, apparently. Like, it really, it really left a big impression on them in that regard. And I thought I was being really polite, and I was being really polite, but they were still, they, they apparently were, like, seething with rage at me about it. Like, okay, there was a part in the car, where we were in the car, and, like, one of them, not the one who was driving, it wasn't her car, but she was, like, in the front seat, in the shotgun, and she was, like, putting on some Pandora in the car, and it was, like, a bunch of, like, Billboard Top 40 pop songs, uh, for the most part, and it was, like, um, a weird rock cover of somebody I used to know was playing, and I was like, huh, and, and I, and I looked at Nikki, and I was just like, man, you know, when the, uh, when the interesting musicality of this track is taken away, I notice how kind of stupid the lyrics are, lol, you know, I, I just, I just said that offhandedly. And then, um, like, at, at another point, they were playing Drive-By by Train, and I was like, oh man, Nikki, you know, I heard, I, I watched this one YouTube review of this song, and it was, like, deconstructing how it's, like, in a way, the worst lyrics possible, like, like, hefty bag to hold my love, that's a weird way to express love. And I even mentioned, like, I'm really enjoying this song, though, I love the beat of it, I'm, I'm enjoying it at least sitting now, I'm enjoying all this music, you know, it's a fun time we're having, um... I was even complimenting the scenery of that we were driving through. I'm like, man, all this countryside and these buildings and how the roads are like brown instead of gray. That's so cool because like they're like it's like brown tarmac, which was totally unique. Um, so those music comments were interpreted by her as quote belittling my music taste unquote, and I was like, oh shit, I guess you're right. I didn't think about that. You know, I. My main friends, my primary friends, are people who we, we do podcasts where we just shit on each other's opinions constantly. And then we have a little Discord chat where we shit on each other for our opinions constantly. I'm so not used to that, you know? Like for me, just like making critical statements of some piece of media that is put in front of me is totally normal and so natural. I don't think about how, you know, it could affect people. Now, I mean, I do, I do think about it. I don't try to be an asshole. Like... It's just that it was the kind of song she was putting on. She was putting, like, pop songs that I've heard already, and I never listen to pop music. I'm talking about music that's so popular, I've heard it. Like, again, somebody I used to know, number one song of 2012, Drive By By Train, one of those songs that was, like, a big hit and is still played consistently to this day. I feel like everyone is entitled to a positive or negative opinion of those musics, of those songs, and is totally of their right mind to express them openly. Like, if the friend, if that girl was even putting on, like, a full album of something, or was putting on something that was a little bit more obscure, was putting on something with a little bit more, like, specificity to it, wouldn't have said a damn thing. Because I would have known that it was, like, special to her, you know? Like, she did put on a bunch of, like, like, mid-2000s, like, Disney pop, and she said, yeah, I love 2000s Disney pop. Like, I know she was being ironic with it, but, like... No, 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 she wasn't being ironic with it. She was being self-aware about that fact, but she was being sincere. Like, I love that, that era, that style, you know, that I'm so nostalgic for. And Nikki even was like, yeah, I totally agree, you know? And all that pre-2010 Disney pop, I'm totally down with. So, just that level of personal affection, I wouldn't have said any critical thoughts. I would have only said positive things, right? But when you're when it's drive by by train, I'm it's completely okay to be like, huh, the lyrics in this song are stupid. Cause like those those songs belong to everyone, you know? So I I, I don't think I did anything wrong. I, I honestly I stand by anything I said that day. But 
it is inter I'm not like, I don't like have a grudge or anything. I just find it really interesting how I come off to people, you know? Like, it's okay that they get mad at me or whatever. Like, they, they can have their opinion of me. And uh, it, I, was, I was sort of getting the vibe that they were mad more because Nikki spends so much time with me on chat and audio call that she doesn't spend as much time with her friends as she used to, and they're, like, kind of upset about that. So the fact that when they finally met me, I wasn't, like, imminently charming or anything and was, in fact, really awkward and quiet... Probably, you know, they were probably getting ready to, they were probably kind of ready to get mad. So, you know, that, 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 that's perfectly understandable. You know, again, I'm not saying that people shouldn't be like that. Because people like that, I don't really care about their opinion of me at all. Uh, which I guess is kind of a problem. I guess that's where the arrogance comes from. Uh, but still, I do think it's really interesting. Because it just goes to show what a weird social circle I surround myself in, in the form of the PCP. Where, like... Uh, yeah, it was like a culture shock sort of the, sort of thing, you know? And by the way, Nikki herself is not like that at all. She was like, yeah, my friends are totally overreacting, you didn't do anything offensive at all. And Nikki will tell me if I do things that are awkward or weird. Like, she will be op open with me about that, uh, but she stands by everything I said. So, I think I'm fine, but yeah, it's just... It, normies, man. People with normal, uh, music taste is a thing. Okay, well, that's the g gradual, annoying petering out of that topic as well. Let's see what's else on, uh, what else, Os Osler else is on my notes here. You know, I was, uh, I was kind of upset when, when the last day of being over at my girl, Matt Nikki, came. I was like, oh man, now I gotta pack it up, gotta go away. <sighs> and she was, like, really upset about it. She was like, no. And I was like, yeah, don't worry, we're gonna see each other again, you know. Um, but I was packing, and I was, like, getting really sentimental about the week we'd spent in this little tiny hotel. And, like, I- whenever I'm packing to, like, leave a place that I know I'm not gonna come back to again, I get really sentimental about it. Like, I'm like, okay, this is it. This sock here is the last sock that I need to pack, and once I'm done with this, I'm done with the sock packing. And, like, oh man, this piece of trash right here is the last piece of trash in the apartment. Here we go, and I like hold it above the trash can, and I'm like, and I drop it, and it like slow motion falls into the trash can, and I'm like, that's the end of the trash, you know, and like, um, when I'm going out the door, I'm like, this is it, this is the last I'm gonna see of this room, dun dun dun, and like when I, um, when I was moving, when I was moving out of my parents' house to come and, you know, live in Virginia, like, um, you know, I just had this really like, I packed over the course of like two days, and I like did it really methodically, and was like, Yep, that's, this is the end. I even filmed my room right before I left. I was like, this is what my room looks like, you know? And, and when I was stepping out the door on the way to get to the air, air, airport, I'm like, okay. I actually filmed myself walking out the door and, like, filming the last shot, the last glimpse of my room, the way that it looked before my sister moved into it and made a mess out of it. Um, like, a mess that's even worse than the mess I had it in. Which, uh, you know, I, I've been to my room again. I visited my family for the holidays, but, you know... Yeah, um, which reminds me of like um, another move that happened previously, like three years ago, um, when I when my family moved in 2013. I was pre all prepared to pack sentimentally, but then I got fucking sick, and I was sick for like a whole day, and I I couldn't get out of bed. And then when I was finally better, we had like a few hours to pack, and I was like, and I had to pack all like frantically, and I couldn't be dramatic at all. I couldn't be like nostalgic at all, and I was so pissed off. I'm like, I was cheated. I was cheated out of my sentimentality. You know, I just realized, if we develop space travel and people can, like, move to Mars and stuff, will they be sentimental for the Earth? Like, will I be sentimental for the Earth? Like, I bet, um, like, you know, the, the travel company that will, like, hey, you know, for 20,000 bucks, go to Mars, you know, and live there, start, be on the colony, I bet they'll be like, hey, for an extra 3,000, or, uh, it'll probably be like 100,000 to get to Mars, and it's like, oh, hey, for an extra 20,000, trip around the world for like five months to, so you can finally see the Earth. You can finally see all those wonderful locations that you never got to see on your home planet, you know? Like, let's give them one final goodbye, you know, before before you <laughs> before you go on the ship to go to Mars and stuff. That'll probably happen. So, yeah, yeah, I packed it up and then I uh, got, on, got on the plane, you know, I went and I ended up in the Chicago O'Hare Airport, which is which was the step, the stepping stone to get over to Virginia. So, 
I was like, okay, so which terminal do we gotta go down? And I, I went the wrong direction. I got to the end of, like, the C terminal, I think. And I was like, okay, so here I am. Actually, no, it was, like, the E terminal or something. Or the F terminal? I think it was E terminal. And, uh... <clears throat> I was like, oh, wait, I'm at the end of the terminal. It's a dead end. Wait, this isn't the right place. Oh, it's in the B terminal. So, I began walking. And it was a long-ass walk. You know, every uh, airport I've been to, I've always been told, this is a small airport. And I'm like, what are you talking about? This place is huge. Like, oh man, the Virginia airport. Kind of a small airport. I'm like, what? The Virginia airport is like five times the size of the Kansas City airport that I come from, you know? Um, the Chicago airport was like a Lovecraftian experience of a walk. Like, it was just like giant, giant endless hallways one after the other. It was ridiculous. And it wasn't great on my ankle either. Incidentally, my ankle is... Is, is definitely still still healing, and especially after this whole week where I spent walking around with my girlfriend constantly. Now I'm, I'm now I'm back to sitting down and not walking, so hopefully it'll be healed up by by summer. Hopefully, jeez. Anyway, you know it was a lot of walking, right? And it's cool. I love walking, except for the fact that I have my ankle problem. But other than that, walking is cool. It was a really cool scenic trip, and I was like, man, this is a cool place. And uh, then my flight got delayed a couple times and then canceled, and it's like, yeah, um, you're gonna gonna have to uh, go your, your flight is gonna be like 15 hours from now and I was like oh so it's like go to the customer support place and they're gonna give you some meal vouchers and a hotel voucher and I'm like okay so I went back to like the C terminal or something and the line was super long and some customer support lady was like hey go actually no no it was the B terminal that I was at but then the, the customer lady was like hey the, the um customer support lady was like hey go to the C terminal and I was like, okay, because she said there's another line there that's not as long. I hadn't been to the C terminal. Like, on my trip from the E terminal to the B terminal, I didn't go to the C terminal. So that one was like this huge, it, like, the, there's this underground bridge you have to get through that's like all colorful and like just, just felt like some sort of purgatory land with those automatic runways, walkways. And then you get into the C terminal and it's like a totally different section that I didn't even see, for lack of a better term. And so it's like, man, this place is so freaking huge. And uh, so I got up to the customer support, and they were like, okay, here's your meal vouchers. And uh, I actually declined a hotel voucher. I was trying to negotiate for just more meal vouchers, but I didn't get the negotiation. But I just refused the hotel voucher. And here's why. First of all, I don't want to have to... um deal with like transitioning like it was a difficult transition mentally to be like okay i'm with i'm in the hotel now i'm in a car now i'm in you know the airport now i'm going through security now i'm in the airport then i get on an airplane then i'm on an airport again right so what i wanted to do was then get on an airplane then go to the virginia airport then be in digi's car then go get sushi and then i'm home right that's the number of transitions if i get if i take the hotel voucher it adds two more steps the step of get out of the airport get on a bus like a shuttle that they were going to offer, go into a hotel, check into a hotel just to be there for like one night, then check out, then go into a bus again, get into the airport, and then go through security again. For a couple of reasons. One, I, I haven't done it enough times to be natural at it. Like, I like the first time I went through it, I was like, okay, electronics go here, but not big electronics, but like what? But like, what's a big electronic? Where is the scale there? Where is the line drawn? You know, and okay, like sometimes they just look through all of my stuff, but sometimes they just scan it, you know? And also, uh, this time on the trip back, I have a, um, a vibrator thingamajig that Nikki wanted me to get, so I was like, I don't know how many times I want to, like, take that out and put it in a little plastic tray for everyone to inspect, you know, but, oh well. Um, but the main, but the other problem with going through security again was that over the course of packing, leaving the hotel, and, like, going through security the first time, uh, my zipper just died. Like, this is like a... This is like a 13-year-old um, suitcase, so the zipper just died from pressure. And so then, when I was waiting around in the Chicago airport, the zipper like just came completely undone. I had no way to secure it, and so like the, the airport people gave me some like tape. Okay, they gave me tape to just seal it shut with tape. So it's like, you know, obviously I just have to get more tape, but that'd be a pain in the ass. I wouldn't want to inconvenience them like that to rip off the tape and then ask them for more tape, because they might not have it with them. Uh, I wouldn't want to have to buy my own tape. I wouldn't want to have to blow money on that. And so it's like, if I go to the, if I go to the hotel, I'm not going to be able to open my suitcase anyway, right? Like, I might be able to haphazardly retie the tape, but that would just be such a pain. So it's like, I'm not going to be able to be comfortable anyway, because I'm not going to be able to open my suitcase. Not until I get home. And now I am home, I... 
I still haven't opened the tape yet, but, uh, yeah, I'm recording this before I put my clothes on and stuff. But anyway, so there was, there was that, right? All those reasons why I didn't want to go to a hotel. But the number one reason why I didn't want to go to the hotel was because, you know, I was getting sick. I had gotten sick on the way packing from the hotel. Like, when I was leaving Nikki, and I was like, I was getting a sore throat, I was getting stuffy. So at this point, I was, like, thoroughly sick, and I was like, okay. In combination with my deliriousness from, like, transitioning from a hotel to an airport and stuff, I'm tired, right? I'm tired from expending all this energy, I'm mentally, like, tumultuous, I'm, like, turbulence in my mind, and I'm sick, and I'm tired, probably. So, what I assumed would happen is that I'd get to the hotel, I'd fall asleep at some point, it would probably take me a few hours to get to sleep, and then I'd sleep so hard that my alarm won't wake, won't wake me up, and then I'll miss my flight, right? Like, knowing me, there's a decent chance that that could happen. Um, not like a high chance, but like not a chance that I would want to risk, right? And, uh, and so then what I thought was that, well... Obviously, what's most likely is that I'd be so afraid of that happening that I wouldn't be able to sleep at all. Like, I'd never be able to be calm enough to go to sleep because I'd be so nervous that that would happen, so then I wouldn't be able to sleep anyway. So then what would be the point of going to the hotel and deal dealing with all the inconveniences of that? You know, like, just, just stay in the airport. So I refused the hotel voucher, and I thought, I'm just going to stay in the airport, and I'm going to do the whole sleep in an airport thing, right? Because I knew that if I'm sleeping in the airport... I'm not going to be able to sleep comfortably enough, I'll still be on edge enough that, like, I'll wake up easily, right? And indeed, I was only able to sleep for, like, 20 minutes here and there and lay down for a couple hours here and there, so, you know. But yeah, uh, so, and, and also, the other reason was that I thought being in this ho in this uh, airport for, like, 13 hours, 15 hours would be pretty cool, you know? I'd just be wandering around, doing whatever I want, have $20 of free food, you know? So, so I did it, and, um... You know, uh, I like the movie uh, Terminal, starring Tom Hanks, where a dude gets stuck in a ho in an airport for like years, like a year and a half, I think. So, or nine months, I think. Yeah. So that was an that was a cool movie, and I was like, I want to do that. You know, being on an airport for like 15 hours. So there's this sort of like romanticization I have of it in my mind of like you know living all it's like living on your own as like this weird vagabond in this place. And it really didn't, like, get me down at all, because it's like, I'm, I was just thinking, you know, when I get home, I'm just gonna, like, lay down in bed and play Earthbound a bunch on my phone using a MOGA 2 Pro Controller, where you can play a controller on your phone with an emulator of Super Nintendo with Earthbound inside of it, right? So, like, I, I'm just gonna do that when I get home, so... If I'm stuck in the airport for 15 hours, I'll just play Earthbound for 15 hours, same difference, just with a bunch of noise and fluorescent lighting around me. I ended up not playing that much Earthbound though, I was mostly just on a call with, with Nikki because she was all sad that I was gone and so she just needed to keep talking to me and, you know, I was getting pretty lonely so I guess the point is I felt really productive still, like the, the small amount of Earthbound I played I felt really accomplished in and like the, the other things I was doing I felt really accomplished in. Um, uh, there was like this, uh, this sort of narrative that unfolded with a towel at the airport when I was there the whole time. Uh, which was the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy reference, um, to, to explain the joke to people. In Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, they mention that if you have a towel with you, a towel with you while you're hitchhiking, you're gonna look much more competent as an individual. You will look like a hoopy frood. And a hoopy frood means someone who is really amazingly together, someone who's really competent and knows what they're doing, if you have a towel with you. So I read Hitchhiker's Guide on the flight over to see Nikki, and I was like, huh, a towel. And I just so happened to buy a towel at Walmart when I was with her, because I felt like having an extra towel for the hotel. And then when I was packing up, I'm like, you know what? It's going to be an unnecessary waste of space, but I'm going to take the towel with me uh, just for the sake of being hoopy. So, um, yeah, and I tweeted about it extensively. So I recommend going to my Twitter and scrolling down to, like, um... February the 21st, and just reading, I highly recommend reading all of my tweets from that, from that, uh, section, from that timeline, uh, from the 21st up through March 1st. But yeah, being in an airport, uh, I felt really competent, I felt really put together, you know, the only thing that sucked about it was being sick, and not being able to walk too much without my ankle getting sore. My motorcycle came and went, anyway, um, yeah, uh, I felt really, I felt like I was really using my time really well, and it was just that looming overhead knowledge of a schedule, of like a time you have to do something, right? Like, you know, I've, 
I, I've, I, I've flown a bunch of times now in the last, in the last five months, you know, flying over to Virginia, then flying over to my family and back, and then flying over to Nikki and back. So it's like, I, I've, I've done the airport experience a bunch of times in a row now, like three times in a row now. And every time I feel really like I'm, I'm managing my time well, because there's, again, this looming overhead schedule that you have to conform to, but it's a schedule that mostly involves sitting around, right? And whenever you see business dudes who obviously fly all the time, with their laptops, they seem really wired. They seem really plugged in. They seem like they really know what they're doing. They seem like every second is being maximized for efficiency. And that's what I felt like um, in the Chicago airport that whole time. Like, I felt like I was always doing something, whether playing Earthbound or talking to Nikki or tweeting something funny. So, and I was like, I wonder if that's part of how, of where Casey Neistat gets his power. Because Casey Neistat's a very prolific person who makes... You know, who did like a whole vlog series where he made a, a fully edited vlog every day for like a year and a half just to do, just for the sake of itself. Um, and he still makes a pretty decent upload of videos and he does all sorts of other business things all the time. I mean, and it's because, well, not because, but in addition to that, he flies places all the time. Like, businesses phone him up, be like, hey, fly to this place. They give him a first class ticket and he's just flying all the time, all over the place. And I'm like, uh,. Man, I wonder if that's part of where his productivity comes from. That he, do you, you always have these, these, these upcoming dates where you have to do something, but most of those dates involve sitting around and you can open your laptop and do something then, you know? And I, and, and I was like, yeah, it, it's, it's a very distinct, different feeling from what I do normally uh, and what Digi does normally and what Ben and the other PCP people mostly do is you're just in your room for weeks on end not even really needing to leave, having to completely motivate yourself to get stuff done. And I love doing that. I love motivating myself and, and making it all happen. And like, I feel like I'm pretty good at it and stuff. But I do think it was a very interesting, different feeling to have this whole airport thing going on. So maybe if, you know, maybe if uh, when I'm rich and I can just fly around all for the sake of it, or I don't know, like I, I, I do all these business things that involve flying around a bunch. Maybe I'll be even more productive then. Maybe I'll really dig that lifestyle. I don't know. But, you know, I don't know. Probably not necessary. I'm pretty good at this being at home thing. Probably as a result of being homeschooled. You know, like, uh, my parents' policy was basically like, hey, you can do what you want, right, with your life. Like, if, if you're willing to work and it's something sensible and you're going to be responsible, you can take the life path that you want to take, right? So, like, my younger brother, he got into, like, uh, into, like, hunting and guns and, like, knives and just being, like, an outdoorsman kind of dude. So that's kind of the life he leads and also working with my dad and playing video games and stuff. But yeah, he's just sort of, he's sort of like that. Uh, and, you know, working out and being slim. He doesn't work out enough to, like, have, like, visible muscles, but he's got, like, a, a nice fit body and stuff. Plays sports, I think. That kind of guy. My sister, you know, she got into dancing and, like, performing, the performing arts, so that's kind of her life. And she actually wanted to, like, go to a school. So eventually she convinced my parents to be like, okay, you can go to, like, this sort of Christian school thing, you know? Um, so that's her lifestyle, right? Me, I was just like, oh, I guess I'll just stay in my house all the time, you know? I'll just stay inside. Uh, I go outside a lot, but mostly just my backyard. That's kind of what I like. I like being outside. I like fresh air and sunlight, but I'm okay just being on my own property. You know, that's what I like about trampolines. You know, that's actually should have probably been on the list. Is a, It's a great way to like just exert physical energy without leaving the site of your house, you know? It's a whole lot of activity without without even going away from your back door. And, you know, pools are the same thing. So that's kind of what I'm into, you know? I like getting out and going places, but I'm perfectly content to just stay still all the time. And when all of your schoolwork is also homework, I guess I just am good at, at doing that kind of work, where you just have to motivate yourself, you're in your bedroom, you could be playing DS right now, but you're going to do the work anyway, you know? Uh, so, so there you go. That's, that was like my lifestyle choice in combination with the lifestyle my parents sort of gave to me. Uh, you know, the downsides are that, you know, I'm, I'm more awkward as a result because I didn't want to go out and like talk to people all the time. So like, you know, I, I come off as like quiet or when I do talk, I'm way too loud. Uh, you know, that's a downside, but the upside is that I feel like I'm really well specced to be a YouTuber. Like all my stats are really, uh, leveled up in that regard. Uh, to be a YouTube person who can also 
work at making programs and stuff. Yippee! Whoops. And uh, that's it. That's the end of this episode of the Rue Hadron Collider episode 4. Even though to me it feels like episode 7 because of all those other ones I recorded that, uh, I don't know, maybe I'll release them at some point. Maybe I could um, release them as bonus episodes only for, uh, hmm, maybe for the PCP Patreon. I could do that. Yeah, maybe I'll do that. I don't know. Tell me how badly you'd want to listen to them. I, I guess you'd probably want to listen to them just because you have no idea what they're about, but, you know, most of them are redundant off of each other because each one was meant to be a replacement of the other one. I don't know. Okay, whatever. That's the end. Um, I'm going to take a sip of this tea even though it's all gone for dramatic effect. Sighing for dramatic effect.